Hello and welcome to Backstage Pass. My guest today is the CEO, chief cook, and bottle washer at ETC, the one and only Fred Foster. Fred, welcome. Thank you. And thank you for giving us the space to work in today. This is great. You're the brave guy who came out to Wisconsin in February. <laughs> what can I say? <laughs> yeah, it's okay. The weather, the weather behaved itself. Um, doing my research in, uh, and before coming out here to do the interview, there's not a lot that I can find prior to your start at, uni at university. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm wondering where you grew up, what kind of influences were there that got you into the entertainment business in the beginning? The first one is easy. I was born in Madison, Wisconsin. My father was a law professor at the university, my mother on the academic staff. So I am a townie. I'm born and bred University of Wisconsin townie. Um, the, and we grew up on, I grew up on the lake. What Madison has four lakes, and so the summers were do we go water skiing or sailing? And my brother and I were both sailboat racers. We sailed together. Um, and um, that weaves through the early days of ETC quite a bit, the whole sailing thing. Um, the, uh, we were two brothers who sailed on the same boat, and we alternated. One would steer one day, the, another would steer the next day. And, or the next race, and we did it rather than the skipper making the decisions when to come about, the crew did, because they would watch the wind shifts while the skipper made the boat sail fast, which works great until the brother whose hand is on the tiller doesn't agree with the brother who's telling him <laughs> what to do, and we would get into fist fights. So we mm -hmm. came up with the one-hit rule, which allowed the skipper to hit the crew once during a race without retaliation, ah. and it worked pretty well. Right. Um, so our summers were spent doing that from, I don't know, 15... 12 until whenever, actually we kept sailing after we started the company as well. Um, how I got hooked into theater um, is I had a crush on the leading lady in a, in a junior high school musical. And my first lighting gig was turning the lights on and off with circuit breakers. Right. And um, I certainly never wanted to be on stage. Um, the few times I have have been unmitigated disasters and won't do that again. Um, but uh, I was, I enjoyed the experience. I think part of what I saw looking back on it even now is that it drew a type of person I was interested in, not the jocks, not the um, popular kids, but all the misfits. And so then by coincidence, my high school homeroom, where you start the day out, was in the auditorium. And I looked up, there's a real theater that had dimmers, and I looked up and there were spotlights up in the beams, and I said, hey, this is pretty cool. And that was pretty much the end of my academic career. <laughs> 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 I, um, uh, throughout high school, we, the students really got to run the stage, and particularly after my second year, our drama teacher quit, and they didn't hire a drama teacher, and I ended up with being the stage manager and having the keys to the theater and producing shows. Um, and one of my favorite shows of all time is The Fantastics. And so um, I went to New York with my father and went to Samuel French and negotiated the rights, in other words, gave him a check to do it and um, directed it and got a student cast. Um, I filled every role. Um, except one. Uh, the last role I filled before I ran out of people was with um, the class clown, and he played the man who dies, and I got him to do it by selling him my Volkswagen Beetle for 50 bucks. But then I was out of cars, and I still hadn't cast the old actor, and I ended up stuck being the old actor. The old was, actor, right. That's the moment that <laughs> will keep me off stage for the rest of my life. You know, whether you're standing and looking, it's four people on the stage, El Gallo, the man who dies, um, the boy and me, and it was my line, and I knew it was my line, and they knew it was my line, and nobody had a clue what the line was. Right. And probably lasted 20 seconds, but in my mind, it's still going on. Oh, yeah. exactly. <laughs> so, so that kept me off the stage. Um, and at that point, um, the, so much of my time was backstage. I took architectural drafting, but the drafting teacher let me do a set design for it. And um, so... Uh, there was, given that I'm in an academic family, there's a lot of academic pressure. I have a sister, Susan, who's four years older than I am, and my brother's two years older than I am. 
and they both, neither of them graduated from high school, they went straight to college. Um, I had to beg half a credit to, from the English teacher for a stagecraft course I taught, but didn't take to get out of school, to right. graduate. But there was a really, at that time in Madison, um, the University of Wisconsin had a stunning program which was led by Gilbert Hemsley. Right. And Gilbert had come out, he, he was a Yaley, he was working up the Jeannie Rosenthal tree and all of that, but then at some point he had a falling out where he didn't show up at one of his assigned shows and so he was ostracized from the Broadway community and he retired to Bucolic, Wisconsin to teach. And, um, but he was such a dynamic teacher and such a dynamic individual that he drew amazing people. Um, by the time I joined the program, he'd, he was actually, he uh, trying to think, it was 1975, so he had come out, I think, in the late 60s. And his first student um, was Dwayne Schuler, and Dwayne is now an incredibly successful opera lighting designer. Right. Um, uh, when I was there, um, the, there were 160 kids in the undergraduate lighting program, and mm -hmm. he marshaled more than a dozen graduate students from stage management to lighting to in every department, whether it was dance or music or opera or theater, he had built this fiefdom. Right. Um, but it, people were so, the people he drew were so amazing. Um, and the other thing that Gilbert did, which he would take us out on the road as his assistants, right. unpaid, but he'd cover our expenses, sure. which kind of, again, ticked off the Broadway community because mm. they paid their assistants. But when I was a freshman, I spent two weeks in New York City when he was lighting two shows at the op at the Met, basically getting sandwiches for the design table, but it was an incredible experience. Oh, yeah. um, he, before I'd gotten in the program, he did the Jimmy Carter inaugural, and he was entirely staffed by his graduate students and, and such. So it was a very, very dynamic time, and um, what I usually say about this is, I'm a fairly arrogant man now, but at 18, I was astoundingly <laughs> arrogant. And I was pretty convinced I was going to be the world's greatest lighting designer. Right. Um, pretty convinced. I was totally convinced. Right. Until I got to the university and started seeing what the competition was just in that field. And, and what really got me out of it was color. Um, I can bore you to death with the science of color, but I can't pick a shirt that goes with a pair of trousers. Right. And... Um, to get into an environment where people intuitively know, understand color on an artistic stance, and I said, this just, I can't do this. And so um, throughout high school, my brother had an interest in electronics and physics. He ended up with a PhD in, from Harvard in physics. Um, and we had talked about trying to combine his electronics interest with um, my lighting interest. We made dimmers and this sort of thing. Um, and so um, eventually we combined our interest in what became ETC. Right. And that's one of the things that I wanted to come back to. Um, but first, with your family, mm -hmm. yeah, as you say, you came from an academic uh, environment and you were heading nowhere near an mm -hmm. academic environment. Was the support there? Um, well, my. I always felt that my father wanted one of us to be a lawyer, and I was his last shot. My sister right. got her degree, got a PhD in marine ecology. My brother got a PhD in physics, and here I was stumbling through theater. And you know, basically math, which is really important as a lawyer, the, the critical thinking, logical thinking teaches mm -hmm. you. I was pretty much screwed in arithmetic when they started putting letters in equations. Right. You know? okay. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> so um, it was pretty clear this was not a direction I was going to go, and. We had a deal in our family that when we graduated from undergraduate, mom and dad would buy us a car. And my sister got a Subaru, she was a tree hugger. Um, my brother got a Volkswagen Golf, I think they called them at the time. Right. And so I dropped out of school. It, um, I lasted, it took me two years to become a sophomore because right. I was so involved in mm -hmm. things and we had started the company. And so I dropped out um, and it was about two or three years before ETC could actually pay us. And at one point after I had a small salary, 
mom and dad invited me over for dinner and drinks, and we were sitting on the porch looking at the lake, and dad said, well, my mom, your mom and I have been talking, and we think you've earned a car. There so, you go. So, so you had achieved a, yes. some semblance yes. of success. But I didn't want a Subaru or a Volkswagen Rabbit, so okay. I bought the other half of a Datsun 280ZX. Okay, there you <laughs> so, go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, there, there was pressure, but in, I think that that was really an indication of dad's acceptance of... Right. Um, where I was going, mm -hmm. and that it didn't require the degree. Right. Do I have a chip on my shoulder about not having a degree? Of course I do. Um, Why is that? Well, it was something I was supposed to do. And, you know, it, it was a very interesting thing. Education, in maybe a perverse way, I am fascinated by how lighting is taught around the world. And mm -hmm. given that I dropped out, it, it, maybe that's why. But um, the at one point, uh, somebody who had shared, had the same high school teacher I had when he was teaching at a different school came up to me at a trade show and explained that he had just graduated from uh, undergraduate. He was really interested in lighting. Should he go to graduate school or should he go straight out and start working? And I was not necessarily the person to ask about this. But, <laughs> um, so I, I did what I often do. and I put him in touch with people who I thought would know. And one of them was Mark Stanley, who was one of Gilbert's students as well. Okay. And Mark, um, Mark's direct answer to him was, well, here's your choice. You can go off and start working, but then your education is done. Um, going to graduate school is the last time for you to selfishly be spoon-fed the information you want. And this made a certain amount of sense to me. You know, that um, the kid ended up going off and apprenticing with um, Ken Billington and didn't go to graduate school, but it was a, a, a valid point. Well, I'm not so sure that apprenticing with Ken Billington isn't graduate school in and of itself. Oh, it's learning. There's no yeah. question about it. It's yeah. learning on the job, but it's not academics. You know, Gilbert had this great drawing, which I still have, um, which is a broad line, two lines going up, an arrow with a heart. And what it is, the broader your base of knowledge, the higher you can go in the thing you love. Right. And he gave that to me when he was trying to convince me that I should take art history. And I said, why should I take art history? I want a light. I want to hang lights. I want to focus. And he was trying to convince me that that's actually the, um, the, the vernacular that you have to be able to understand and mm -hmm. speak because when you go into a design meeting and the director says, I want this to look like Vermeer, you cannot go look up who Vermeer is. <laughs> yeah, right. You have to know what that is. Exactly. And, you know, so it was, I completely understand it and agree with it. Um, I just was too impatient to learn, to go to school. Right. Um, While doing that research on you, uh, I read about the time that you and your brother Bill built the, uh, that console in, in your basement, and it was the result of having something happen. I think you, well, I want you, if you want to the tell story? that story, sure. How ETC started? Yeah. Okay. So um, I'd mentioned that throughout high school, Bill and I were looking for some way to combine his electronics and my theater passions, and we had made a early dimmer and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but then at the UW, I got there in 75, they built a new building in 73 and put a Klegel Q file in which is technically a thorn Q-file. And um, I thought this was really cool. It was an early memory system. It wasn't actually technically a computer. It's right. a state machine, but um, I thought this was really great. And I said, Bill, you've got to come look at this. And he came down, and putting this in perspective, this was when the first 8-bit microprocessor, the 8080, came out, which was the first viable microprocessor. This ended up in the Radio Shack TRS-80 computer. right? Um, but at that point, every computerized lighting system had a mini computer in it, and this thing was installed for $150,000 in 1973. It was three racks of electronics, this control desk, and Bill looked, took one look at it, and his direct quote was, "Gack, this is disgusting, we can do it for $5,000. Mm. And so um, this was in the fall of 75. Um, we had a couple of friends. Jimmy Bradley was a sailboat racing friend. Gary Buick was my brother's high school classmate. They were like total geek math club members and that sort of thing. And so, and they, Bill and Gary shared an office in the physics department. And so we said, okay, let's do this. And we went, arranged to go have a meeting with Gilbert. And at this point, there were so many people in the program, you'd have to get an appointment with them, which was sometime today. 
and then you'd kind of hang out wherever he is. And so this turned out to be Christmas Eve of 1975, and he was having a party at his house. And his parties were legendary, as you can imagine. I don't think they ever ended, um, involving a lot of cheap Lambrusco wine and smoke billowing in from the porch and this sort of thing. Um, and so we waited around until it was our time. It was about 11 o'clock. And the other kind of thing that happened in Gilbert's meetings, unless it was a really personal thing, anybody at the party who wanted to be in the meeting could be there. And this ended up being in his bedroom. Um, he was sprawled out on the bed. Alan Edelman, who's a very successful designer and was a graduate student at the time, I remember him sitting up on a, a dresser and some other people were there. And we said, we're going to build a Q file. And the general reaction in the room was, yeah, sure. Right. And that pretty much pissed us off. And so um, we went back and we scraped anything we could together. We buy get cast off parts from the physics department. We found this company called Polypax that advertised in the back of Electronics Magazine that um, we thought their motto was, sure, some pins are missing from this chip, but at these prices, who cares? But you get chips really cheaply. Um, and at some point along this, um, the one thing that we couldn't beg, borrow, or steal was an eight-inch floppy disk drive. And that cost 1,200 bucks. So the four of us each threw in 300 bucks to get to pay for it, and therefore ended up with a quarter of what became ETC. Um, it's interesting, at this point, my parents were living in Afghanistan. My father had a, this was before the Russians came in, and he had something with the State Department to go and try to help them put together uh, essentially an appellate system in their ju judicial structure, because everything was tribal, but there was no appeal thing. So he, they were living in Afghanistan, and um, I would, uh, go into dad's secretary to get my allowance a little too frequently. And so she was uncomfortable, sent a letter to my mother, and my mother had a deal saying, okay, anytime Freddie comes in and asks for money, he, d he gets 50 bucks if he hands you a letter and you mail it to me. And she kept these letters over the years. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the letters, it's on, you know, the, the blue um, airmail oh, thing, air oh, right? Yeah, sure. And uh, in my scratched handwriting, I said, Great news, I was in a car accident the summer before and I just got $750 insurance settlement so I don't have to borrow the money from you to start the company. And so you could argue that ETC was started by accident. By accident. At least a quarter of it was. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we spent a year putting this thing together and um, started in the basement of my flat but using the physics department and such and ended up with a box that was about a foot, a foot by a foot by three feet and it did everything the Q file did. And we took it back on Christmas Day of 1976, a year and a day later, um, and set it down on the coffee table at Gilbert's house. He was, had a, probably the same party going Same party on. going, yeah. And a lot of the same people were there, and their reaction was, oh shit, you've done it. What are you gonna do with it? And we said, and by this time, I had spent the time at the Met with Gilbert. Mm -hmm. And I proudly, and this, the Met had not computerized. They had a 340, Dimming, dimmer Ward Leonard system with a 10 scene preset. And I said, we're going to sell it to the Met. Well, yeah, good idea. Um, but we were pretty convinced this would work. And so then, so that was in December. In March, there was going to be a, kind of a unique production at the university or at, in Madison where the Madison Opera was going to put on Manon. It was going to be live broadcast on public color television. It was going to be simultaneously broadcast on stereo radio because there was no such thing as stereo color television. And there's going to be a live audience. And this is really Gilbert's machination to put this thing together. And Alan Edelman was a designer. And um, we said, hey, why don't you use our board? And they were thrilled about this because Alan found every light he could find on campus and hung them. And he has 60 dimmers. And, I guess it was another 24 dimmers he found somewhere else. And so he agreed to do this, foolishly. We promised the board would be there two weeks before rehearsal started. Rehearsal started. The load-in happened. Rehearsal started. Wednesday before the Friday opening night. We had, to be honest, had not laid out the circuit boards to interface the con console to the dimmers. We had not engineered that when we were supposed to load in. So we were etching circuit boards at a friend's company, and, and finally... Wednesday afternoon or evening at 6 o'clock, half hour before the second final dress rehearsal, we were ready to plug it in. And, um, we called this Mega Q. So it had the brains and then it had a piece of coaxial cable 
and then a dimmer interface unit. So it really was a precursor of DMX right. sitting in there, right? So um, the dimmer interface unit was this blue box with an 18-gauge power cord, and Jimmy Bradley went to plug it into the wall, he plugged it into the wall, and the theater blacked out. Not just the theater, the dressing rooms, the offices, the lobby, the whole shebang. And I was a, I was a student stagehand in the theater, at the Union Theater, and the house man was Gene Hodgen, and he didn't want us messing with his stuff anyway. And I chased him across the stage, and he was saying, I should have never let your goddamn fucking board in here. <laughs> and I chased him across, downstage left, down a staircase I'd never been in, and came across this black door covered with cobwebs. I, sw I swear this is true. And so he opened the door, and there was a bull switch for this, the um, theater, and it had tripped. And so I reached over and helped him to trip it back on. The lights came on. We got through the rehearsal, and it worked. And we had no idea how this happened. You know, Jimmy Bradley pulled the cord back out, and he was looking at this 18-gauge power cord saying, if I blacked out the theater, I would be burned to a crisp. Right? Right. We couldn't figure it out. Right. But this is when we learned what inrush current was, right. where if you have a light bulb, a 100-watt light bulb, if it's stone cold, it takes 25 times that to, um, to just get to a glowing cherry red. Right. Alan had every light in the, th the city in the theater, and they were all stone cold. Right. There was this flaw that when you plugged in the dimmer interface unit until it made connection, it turned all the lights on to full. Right. And so that tripped the breaker. And so we kind of figured that out sometime later. Um, we made it through that rehearsal, we made it through the next rehearsal. Friday night was opening night, and Gilbert had invited everybody he could think of to come, including a man named Clem D'Alessio from the Met. So, great, we're going to get the order. And so, <laughs> so um, we got through the show, and it worked just fine, and um, the house lights came on, and all the Opera Guild ladies were waddling backstage to this, um, talked to the talent, and Gilbert brought Clem back and said, look at this great switchboard my students have made. And Clem said, could I push a button? And I said, sure. Well, okay, so the lights were cool, and cooled down. There was a button called cut, which instantaneously put a cue on. The last cue, which was the next one in the stack, was a test cue that turned all the lights on at full. Uh -oh. So <laughs> five minutes after the curtain comes down, Clem pushes the button, boom, the lights go out. And, oh, God, Gene Hodge and the stage, the house man just was fit to be tied. And he didn't even come in the next night. And I was left responsible right. for the theater on Saturday. It was going to be broadcast on Sunday. And um, <laughs> Gilbert brought somebody from the Houston Grand Opera back. And he, of course, didn't want to be upstage. He found one other button that did the same thing, but I didn't have the keys to that room in the basement, so it was even a better experience. So here we are. The next day, Sunday, on a matinee, it was going to be simulcast, and my stomach wouldn't let me be there. I was so nervous. Right. And so I went home and walked at my parents' house, and um, every time there would be an intentional blackout, my stomach would just say, oh, have we done it again? But we got through the whole thing. Um, I think it's fair to say we didn't get the order from the Met. <laughs> Yeah, probably not. Um, and that's really how it all started. And, you know, we had dreams of becoming really rich. But right. um, the, at the same time, we were racing sailboats. We were going to school. I was working as a stagehand to pay myself, so I had some money. Um, and uh, it was a while before the company really got any wind in the sails. Mm -hmm. Just out of curiosity, where is that board now? We were on a little brief tour downstairs, and there's a fair amount of older There are only a couple of relics of it. The main circuit board, which was all hand wire wrapped, I wrapped the memory array while I sitting in my pajamas watching the gong show. Um, <laughs> Seems appropriate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that um, I clear cast in a block of resin, so right. we've got that. But it actually had been rated of all of the valuable chips because we needed them for, for the, the next things. generation. Right. Um, there are very few relics. I think that and the top plywood top of the shipping container is all we have right. um, from it. <laughs> so you were talking about how things were in the beginning, and I got the impression that it was a little while before you even got paid for mm -hmm. doing ETC. Uh, how long? How, how long? Well, we consider our birthday to be that Christmas Eve at 1975 at Gilbert's house. Mm -hmm. um, it was probably 1979, four years later, before right. I, um, I was still working as a stagehand, but um, before mostly it was right. work. Um, and by that time, Billy graduated and um, started going to school and, uh, at 
Harvard and Gary had graduated and eventually ended up up at, Star at Stanford and um, that left Jimmy and me running the company. Right. And we, the company was, got to put this in perspective. In 1978, we ended up with selling, making a product for Colortran. The company was a thousand square foot garage that was um, built by somebody, a friend of ours, and it had a toilet, but no walls around the t toilet, right. which was okay, because there were only four of us. Right. And coincidentally, we only had three chairs. And one of the things, one of the tasks we had to do was to lay circuit boards out, which involved using tape on a light tape, on mylar and a light table. And that provided a certain amount of privacy to the toilet, and also the toilet served a double duty as a chair you sat in. Right. So it was a total joke. Um, we finally had to put walls around the bathroom when we hired the first one of our girlfriends. And um, so it was, it was really pretty close to a fly-by-night operation. Um, the, uh, um, how we got from not selling a board to the Met to having a customer was that we went to a USITT trade show in uh, 1977, it must have been, at, uh, in Washington, D.C., at right. the Lafon Plaza Hotel. Oh. And um, we were so poor that we couldn't afford our own hotel room, so we ended up sharing a hotel room with Dwayne Schuler. Right. Dwayne plays through my story several times. Um, and so, because um, he was just starting his career as a lighting designer, and we put MegaQ in its plywood box, carried it down there, opened it up, set it up, and we said, okay, we, th we thought, because Gilbert had a relationship with Kliegel and with Joel Rubin, that we thought we were going to go there and sell the board to Kliegel. Right. So we got it set up and we went to the Kliegel suite, which was legendary at the time. Mm -hmm. USITT was very small compared to what it is now or any real trade show, but the Kliegel suite was where all the movers and shakers were. And so we went in and the, right there in the middle of the the suite was a Kliegel performance board, Gordon Perlman's board, right. and it did essentially everything ours did, and we were just crestfallen. Right. Yeah. So we drank. I was going to say, did you stay and we oh, drank yeah. their alcohol? We drank their alcohol. Oh, okay. It's another thing that, another theme or thread that runs through ETC's history. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and so um, we kind of pulled ourselves together and said, well, we have to do something. So the next morning, we went down to the trade show floor and started hustling manufacturers. And we started out small. We started out um, with Hub, which was a very small company at the time, mm -hmm. run by, we met this really sweet guy named Al Koga. And he came up and he saw the board and he was really gracious. And he, I remember him saying, you know, boys, this is too big a product for our company, but don't quit. And that was one of those things that kind of kept us going because we were really despondent. Um, right. He also took us out to lunch, which was good because we couldn't afford we it. Couldn't afford it. And so um, the next day we got more ballsy and started talking to Century and other companies. And um, one by one they would come up to the room. And um, while I don't have any direct experience with this, I imagine it's what turning tricks is like, where <laughs> you um, empty out the ashtray between each. Um, John and the inevitable happens when one is coming in and the other is leaving and they're hiding their faces. Right. But um, we showed it to ADB, the Belgian company, which at that point was trying to break into the U.S. market. We showed it to um, Ken Van Ice at Berkey Colortran, and at the end of it, we didn't have an order, and right. we were pretty crestfallen. And so we put it back into its plywood box, and we we're too poor to pay a bellman a dollar to carry it down, so we beefed it down the freight elevator. We're sitting on this plywood box in the middle of this marble lobby of the L'Enfant Plaza Hotel, and Ken Van Ice came up to me and said, you know, I'd like you to show this to Bob Benson, who was our marketing guy at the time. And I was tired. I said, fine, if you want to get a bellman and take it up to your room, we'll do it. Figuring a dollar tip would be too much for his blood. He said, fine. So. Got it up, and uh, this was before the days of electric screwdrivers. It was held together with about 20 number eight pan head screws. And right. as I removed the last screw and lifted the top out, I remembered I'd thrown my dirty underwear in on top of it. Nice. We got the order. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't need an explanation for exactly why you got the order. It had nothing to do with my, it had, okay. it had something to do with the fact that their memory center had a Singer computer in it, and Singer went out of the computer business, and right. they, didn't, they needed a product, and they saw it, and it, um, 
they thought it would work. Right. So I, I, most people I talk to, business people who have companies, have that moment, which maybe they didn't recognize it at the time, but looking back, they realized that that was the moment where we, we turned the corner. Was oh, that? Oh, was no. <laughs> <laughs> That was the moment we found the path to the road to drive on. Right, um, exactly. We had no clue. I mean, we, um, and to be honest, we were probably the worst vendor you could imagine. Um, we moved from my basement of my flat to my brother's bedroom at my parents' house. Um, our business telephone number was my mother's telephone number, mm -hmm. and we would be six weeks late delivering a board, and we wouldn't answer the phone, and Ken Van Eyes years later told this story when he was visiting my parents. Um, that he remembered calling and my mother answered the phone and my mother said something to the effect of, oh, I'm sorry, Ken, I'll get the boys off the lake from sailing and get you a light board by Friday. It was that bad a, a, yeah. a situation. Um, and, uh, you know, to your question of did we turn the corner at some point, there have been a lot of different corners and in between them there have been some really challenging times mm -hmm. um, that... You know, had I had I gone to business school and had an MBA, I probably would have quit about a dozen times. Right. Because I would have known that an eight to one debt to equity ratio is bankrupt. Right. But I didn't, so yeah. we just kept going. Right. And so, um, you know, through forty some years of this, there are lots of times, lots of peaks and lots of valleys. Right. Right. Terrific. Okay. We haven't turned a corner yet, then. We haven't turned a corner? That makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Oh, you want me to find a corner we turn? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I'm trying to figure out where and where you want the stories, because, I mean, no. I look at this as a 40-year blend of time, so I don't know how you want me to address that. Um, and, and you did. I, um, I need, if there isn't a corner, some people... Well, I mean, there have been several. Yeah. I mean, there have been several times that are, I look at them now and say these are hugely... These were transformative moments in the company, where the company changed in a big way. Mm -hmm. um, the, probably one of the first was we started out just making computerized light boards where we were competing against... Century Strand and Kliegel and Electro Controls, who were full line companies that could do dimmers, control, and spotlights. Um, so we had teamed up with Teatronics, a dimming company on the West Coast, and Lighting Methods, a dimming company in Rochester, New York, where they would take our consoles and put them with their dimmers to try to compete against the big guys. And um, at some point, that led to the situation where ETC, Al Pfeiffer, had started Lighting Methods about the same day we did but to make dimmers. Um, we talked in about 1988 about putting the companies together because it made sense. The, two, the big companies had, well, this is one of them. The big companies had a really valid marketing argument against us, which is why would you want to buy a lighting system from ETC and LMI? Because when the lights blink, they're going to point fingers at each other, but we make the whole system. We can service the whole system. Right. And we heard that, and it was a very logical argument, and that probably led to our fiendish devotion to technical service, um, right. that we could just never let that happen. And so th that kind of thing would trigger uh, what I would consider the development of one of our key planks in the, the success of our business. Um, so we bought lighting methods, and um, God, I made it worked because we didn't know we couldn't do it. Right. Um, <laughs> we, some of the ideas were my ideas, which turned out to be complete horse shit. Um, <laughs> that, for example, we looked at Racha at lighting methods. They had about 65 people, and we had 20 people. And we made computers, and so of course we can make dimmers. So we didn't need any of the direct labor. We wanted. We had identified a dozen or so employees that mm -hmm. were key employees, um, but. If we can build computers, we can build dimmers. Um, and we were going to move the operations from Rochester to Wisconsin in six weeks. This was all my fantasy. Right? So, um, God, I was just so wrong in so many ways. Um, so we, um, we started this. Well, they, they, another thing we learned along the way, 
Al Pfeiffer allowed us to talk to those key employees because they were actually conditions in our contract, but we'd signed them to a non-disclosure. And these were people like Bill Florek I'd worked with now for five or six years, Alan White, and I would sit down and say, so ETC couldn't buy lightning methods and we want you to come with us. And I would talk for two hours and they didn't hear anything else. All they heard is, you're buying my company, I'm gonna be out of a job, right. even though that's not what we said. Right. And to a person they came back the next day or the next time, said, can I come with you? Yes, that's what we were talking about. <laughs> and then they had concerns about things that were important. Will you help me relocate? Mm -hmm. um, what about vacation time, this sort of thing. So we knew what that reaction was going to be. We got to a situation two weeks out and Al hadn't told his people it was a deal that was gonna happen in two weeks and I got Al, convinced Al to let me, that we would address this together. So I flew out to Rochester and we had a company meeting, which Al had never had, and we're standing in their production area, I'm wearing a suit, and Al says, so many of you know that we buy our computerized light boards from electronic theater controls, Fred Foster is the president, Fred, and he turned to me, and I looked at him and said, you asshole, you're not even gonna take the bullet, are you? So I, <laughs> but what we had done is we had printed out what would now be a fact sheet of frequently asked questions with right. the, roughly the dozen questions that everybody asked with the answers because I was certain, because my message was very different to these people, that they were going to just be shocked and I wanted them to have this to take home to think about. And so I got up in front of everybody and said, so there's no good way of saying this. We're buying ET or lighting methods and we're moving it to Wisconsin in six weeks and we can't take most of you with us. Um, and we had done all the right things. We had an outplacement service. We promised them that if they helped us through the transition, we would give them bonuses and we'd do everything we could to get them jobs, all to make us feel a bit better about taking their jobs away from them. Um, and the six weeks turned into nine months. And at one point, Dick Titus, who had joined us as our vice president of manufacturing, he and I were both out in Rochester. It was from February to May. Um, and he walked into the room I was in and he said, Fred, we've made a big mistake. We need these people. Um, and so we just changed the rules. Instead of bringing a dozen people out, we said anyone who wants to move to Wisconsin. And so we were bringing kids making $5 an hour out to Wisconsin, and we ended up moving 25 people, more than half of them in that direct labor pool we didn't think we needed. Right. So this is a huge learning curve. But it led to another realization um, that one day we had, Bob Gilson, the garage I talked about that mm -hmm. we started in was, built by Bob Gilson, who we knew from sailboat racing. Right. And his father had a company, had started a company that made medical electronics. And so he would let me use his machine shop on the weekends and his way of teaching me to use a piece of equipment was here's a power switch and then when I broke it, he told me what I did wrong. Right. Um, but he did so much to help us. He and his father were so helpful that we at some point either gave or sold him 10% of the company for 500 bucks, right. which indicates <laughs> what it was worth. Um, maybe it's the best investment either one of us made because we would not be, not have been able to get into business without his support and it might be worth a little more than that now. Right. Um, but the, um, he built, he had a cornfield out in front back of his building and so just before we bought Lighting Methods, he had built a 10,000 square foot building for us in his cornfield and we would go up to him and say, Bob, we need another building and he'd say, how big and when? He'd plow out some more cornfield and, and build another building. So at some point we were park, paving the parking lot in between the buildings. And that day I arrived a little late and I had to park two blocks down Laura Lane. And by the time I got to my office, I felt sick to my stomach and I didn't know why. So I sat down and I thought about it and stared out the window, which people catch me doing all the time. And um, what I finally realized is up until that point had ETC blown up, I would have gone back to school and gotten a real job. But walking past all those cars, made me realize that ETC was now responsible for those car payments. And it was one of those bits that flipped right then. And, um, and now we have families, houses, children, grandchildren. So it's just, but that was, I think, another really formative moment for, the, for me and for the company mm -hmm. to realize that it's not a joke anymore. Right. Um, however, we got to the end of that first year, and that's when we, our debt to equity ratio was eight to one. We were virtually bankrupt. And I had to stand up in front of now 85 people, 25 who had ripped their lives away and gone, moved to Wisconsin for this, I said, boy, we're screwed. Um, <laughs> and, um, you know, it, I think that probably from here on out, most of my stories aren't going to be about lighting products because right. 
the focus I now feel towards the company is about the organism we are, about the people, and while periodically I need to prove to myself that I still know something about the industry and I'll stick my nose in a product development thing, I really don't need to because right. we have great people who do that sort of thing. Now. Sure. And so, um, so the the evolution of the company. This is, I mean, maybe that was one of those corners right. that we turned right. um, to start understanding really how important the people are. Right. Um, and this kind of segues into a question which I, I developed after I sent you the original list. Because I know that about the company, and I know that you know you have, if nothing, a, an extraordinarily enlightened approach to the management of this. This. Oh, well, you should talk to some other people before well, you make yeah, that judgment. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> like the people who work at ETC. There's. It's not a universally held statement. Right. Or heard. Okay. Um, but th I was wondering if that kind of approach, that kind of philosophy, if it's. At its very base, is, it, is that learned, or is that something that's intrinsic? It's it's just it's intuitive for cert, for some people. I think for me it was learned. Yeah. Um, at least being able to recognize that was what was inside of me, um, because you know when I said earlier that I was arrogant and still am, that's still in my core. Mm -hmm. um, the it's also very difficult. You know, I think that. One of the things that I have found difficult in the in the history of ETC is delegation, because I am in fact the smartest man in the room in my own mind in almost any situation. And um, to really have an organization be successful, that doesn't work. You have to get people who are smarter than you and recognize that and give them their heads. And um, that's a that's a really difficult thing because, you know, in, in the history of ETC, about the only big things I haven't done are program, write the software or design the electronics. I've done the mechanical design, the aesthetic design, I've sold, I've marketed. You know, finance isn't a forte. <laughs> but, um, and all throughout all of this, I've had to let that go. Right. And in a sense, it is like peeling a layer of skin off each time you do this, and at some point you're out of skin, and um, it's it's a very, very difficult thing. Um, but the benefit is it, it just has to happen. Yeah. But you then, then the next trick is, it's easy to give somebody a new job and the responsibility, but the authority is a hard one. Right. <laughs> um, but back to the question of whether you're born with it or not, I don't know, I, I can't speak to that. I, um, I think part of the reason that people are so important to me and it's such an important aspect of ETC is that um, I have an intrinsic need to be liked by people mm -hmm. and I get that fulfilled every day. That's awesome. It is. <laughs> <laughs>